When Prince William wed Kate Middleton, millions of viewers worldwide tuned in to see the young prince choose his future queen. No one thought that his little brother's wedding would one day cause the same amount of anticipation and excitement. All the hotels in Windsor were booked out, postcards, all the replica mugs. But then again, Harry chose to turn an everyday American girl into a real life princess. It's a bit of a fairy tale story, the prince and the showgirl. The fact that an American is marrying into the royal family is a bit of magic, I think, to the royal family, that sprinkling of stardust. It's the princess fairy tale come to life. Who wouldn't want to celebrate something straight out of a Disney flick? This is that childhood kind of Cinderella story. The story with Meghan Markle and Prince Harry has opened a lot of young girls' eyes to showing that this can happen to them. They can be a princess. Everybody wants to experience that. Everyone wants to feel that. Here's the breakdown from the venue, the cake, and even an astrological analysis of the bride and groom. This is a relationship that they will fight for. They can't stop making eye contact with each other. They hold hands the whole time. A wedding that will not only be celebrated around the world, but heralds an oncoming change in one of the longest reigning royal families. This is much more than just a wedding. It's a cultural shift. It's an incredible love story, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, this is every little girl's dream. It is. Since the November 2017 announcement of the royal engagement hit the news, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's romance has become a mainstay of daily media consumption. I think the British press was brutal, absolutely ruthless. Just be so ugly and so rude and bullies and trolls, it's awful. Speculation on the success of the forthcoming royal marriage began in earnest. But Markle is undoubtedly a perfect fit for Harry and life as a British royal. They're changing their tune now that Harry's standing by her side and saying, this is going to be my wife. And there's gonna be a lot of coverage around this wedding. So they now don't wanna then step back into that role and say, hey, remember all those awful things I said about Meghan? Well, now we're really happy for them. She has shown the world that she's ready to hit the ground running. I think that in Meghan, Harry has found his perfect woman. The fact that they met on a blind date, it wasn't someone who was chasing him up to be with him, like a million one women in England who saw him as the most eligible bachelor. They share a love of sports, that they went to witness the Invictus Games. She does a lot of humanitarian work that Harry's obviously a proud supporter of also. And I think that together, the two of them actually make the absolute dream team. It really is the true Hollywood story, the prince and the showgirl, you know, coming together and I think it's a, a great story. You know, Meghan is a, a celebrity. She understands what it's like to be in the public eye. So it's not like Princess Kate, who sort of came into it from nothing. You know, Meghan knows what her best angle is. She knows how to look great. She knows how to appear in front of millions of people. I've just been here for three months, right? <laughs> and in that You've amount of time, for, well, but with that said, for me, it's very important to once you hit the ground running, even if you're doing it quietly behind the scenes, which is what I've focused my energy on thus far, is meeting with the right people, meeting with the right organizations behind the scenes quietly, learning as much as I can so that I can maximize the opportunity we have here to really make an impact. If moving to another country, planning a wedding, and joining the British monarchy wasn't enough, Markle dove into public life spectacularly, charming the pants off people from London to Belfast. Let's be honest, you know, being a royal, you are playing a role, and that's just the way it is. And I think that Meghan is trained with that already being an actress in America. Um, she's playing a role, and that's whether she's on camera or off here. Looking at what's taken place so far, looking at the reaction that uh, they received in Nottingham, people were delighted. In a similar approach to that of Lady Diana, Meghan has been quietly and secretly exploring ways to make a difference as a royal family member. Earlier this year, she visited survivors of the Greenfield Tower tragedy and the nearby mosque, which served as a triage base when the tragedy occurred. It shows that uh, Meghan's a brave person. The fact she went to the Grenfell Tower where there have been such appalling loss of life 
in such awful circumstances, it proves that she's got the courage to go and face people like that. The secret visit to the Greenfield Tower fire victims was unofficial and an eye-opener for critics who may have doubted her motives for public life. We don't know how that was organized. It does seem it was a private visit, but it was. It also emerged quite quickly in the press. It didn't do her any harm that she was doing that. So there's a bit of PR going on here as well. As a celebrity, as a TV star already, she is already under the scrutiny of the media. She is already in the public eye. She's already walking red carpets. She's used to this, but she also knows that there is expectations that come with that. Palace have been very clever in the way, that, the way they presented Meghan to the world, this sort of humanitarian figure. But it says to me that she's quite courageous. She's happy to face down difficult situations and can cope with it. Valentine's Day, a favorite of Meghan's, was spent in Edinburgh with Harry as part of an official royal visit. We hope the couple found some time for each other between a tour of Edinburgh Castle, a visit to a social bites cafe for homeless youth, and a celebration for the Scottish Year of Young People. As the May wedding date drew closer, Markle's sleeves were rolled up in Northern Ireland with Prince Harry. The pair were greeted with typical Northern Irish hospitality, visiting the Titanic Center, stopping for lunch at the famous Crown Liquor Saloon, and receiving a joyful welcome when they surprised school children at the Amaze the Space Peace Initiative, a program created by Harry. Perhaps the most insightful and telling appearance yet was Markle's debut with the first annual Royal Foundation Forum alongside Prince Harry, Prince William, and the Duchess of Cambridge, Kate Middleton. When we first started it, it started as a very small idea with Harry and I scratching our heads going, how, uh, how can we do something that's going to help us in the future? How are we going to build something that's going to provide almost a vehicle to allow us to um, impact in charitable areas? Because it was quite difficult at the time. Um, Harry and I used to go to a lot of uh, engagements and see these incredible charities doing really great work, but felt that we, we could give more and how could we do that? And so. The foundation idea sort of bubbled up as a sort of vehicle to, to be able to do more when we, when, we, when we walked away from these engagements. This forum was formed by Harry, William, and Kate, with Meghan joining them as the fourth member. The Fab Four had finally made their debut. I think that these are very four very strong individuals. Kate, I think, has been very clever in the way that she's deferred to William and she's developed her own interests within the foundation. Harry will continue doing his interests. I think it's very important that everything is cleared by that they're doing up towards William because he is going to be the future king. And you know, he is the, uh, in terms of the way the royal family work, he's the top dog. I'm not sure that Meghan's necessarily got that. She was very, very well outspoken at that meeting. And sometimes it's best to listen and wait and see. Here, Markle ensured that the doubters could doubt no more. With poise and grace, Markle gave the world a glimpse of her future potential in this arena, showing us her voice, ambition for humanitarian work, and her steadfast commitment to women and girls. What's interesting is I hear a lot of people saying when speaking about girls' empowerment, finding and knowing their worth, or women's empowerment as well, you'll often hear people say, well, you're helping women find their voices. And I fundamentally disagree with that because women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice, they need to feel empowered to use it, and people need to be encouraged to listen. The first forum focused on mental illness and discussed the Heads Together initiative. Ever, as family, do you ever have disagreements about things? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> okay, healthy, healthy disagreements. Okay, the last thing you disagreed on, how do you resolve it? Uh, I can't remember, they come so thick and thick. <laughs> the initiative has been warmly received by the British people and lauded as a success for triggering an ongoing conversation on mental illness, an often taboo social issue, especially in the UK. Leave it to Diana's boys and their other halves to bring light to an issue usually covered in darkness. Heads Together was a, is an amazing convening power 
but also the perception of, of, of mental health now across this country and also in other countries has changed without a doubt. Um, and I think the timing was the timing was, was, was absolutely perfect on that. I think as Meghan will become a member of the royal household, it'll be so interesting to see what influence she brings to the royal family, how she makes it progressive, what she wants to do, because she's very entrepreneurial, she's very clever, she's very um, diplomatic, she's also very philanthropic too. So she'll want to also talk about stuff that she's been passionate about, and I think that will lead to a much more progressive, passionate royal family that we'll feel that we actually know a bit more about. What is incredibly apparent is the tight connection between Harry and Meghan. The loved up couple swear it was love at first sight. Well, according to a renowned astrologer and psychic Calvin Witcher, it was also written in the stars. She is a Leo sun, Libra moon, Leo rising. Leos are very dynamic. They are very alluring. And one of the things about Leos is that you know when they come into a room, you see them, you notice them. They have this very strong appeal. He is with so much of his chart with the Virgo sun, the moon Taurus, um, and then even Capricorn and his rising sign. It actually makes for an uh, interesting dynamic. Virgos tend to be very detailed oriented, very analytical in nature oftentimes. But the thing about Virgos is that they are very calculated in their decision making. So when they do make a decision, they're precise. They know exactly what they're getting into. So someone like Prince Harry knew what he was getting into. He made the decision. He, it was good for him. It wasn't always a match made in heaven for Harry. He's had his share of ups and downs, especially when it came to a certain Libra named Chelsea Davy. Most thought that she would be Harry's forever love. With the Libra side of things, with her probably not wanting to be in the spotlight a lot, that could just pose some challenges with the dynamic of the relationship where she wanted to keep him to himself. And he had the duty to the family to be out into the public, but he needed someone that was a really strong match for that, almost that could support him when he went out emotionally and also just regarding life in general. The challenges that comes with being a Virgo are they can tend to be very critical. They can be detail-oriented, but sometimes maybe a little stubborn in that the, their approach and how they do things. They can see things, but not specifically want to do anything about it. So this would be the person that sees that the house needs to be clean, but maybe they don't want to pick up the clothes themselves. But as it came to be, what a Leo wants, a Leo gets. Giving Harry the love and support he has longed for. Leos are interesting. Some of the challenges that will come up is that they like to be first. They like to be the center of attention. They like to be known. They like to be appreciated. And so sometimes if that doesn't occur, like it's uh, needed, then sometimes they can be a little aggressive, a little too assertive. Sometimes you may see anger that may show up in that dynamic, or sometimes maybe being a little bit pushy. I see some interesting things in their numerological charts, even more so than their astrological charts. He's a life path number one, she's a life path number four. So regarding that, his life path number one, he's very strong and independent. He's a forerunner. He's meant to do things that are different. He's meant to start things that no one else has ever started before. Now with her, she's a number four life path, which is all about structure. It's all about support. So she could be that support to him, even though she's leading in so many different areas. I believe that they knew each other in a, another life. There are some things that are really interesting. I would not be surprised if that they had conversations saying that it was love at first sight. I would not be surprised if they said that it felt like it was meant to be. A lot of that numerological chart and astrology too really lends to probably in a past life they were together. Interesting enough, in their past life, they probably didn't work that well together. They probably didn't synergize as well as they could have together because of some of the karmic lessons that show up in their numerology chart. But now their numerology shows that they're kind of in sync. As excitement builds for the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, it's impossible to ignore the refreshing newness of this non-traditional British royal pairing.
I mean, royal weddings are always important points to kind of reaffirm the dynasty as a showpiece for the power and the stability that comes with the royal family. There's a kind of showpiece for what the country represents. She is from a divorced family. She's worked her tail off to make it in Hollywood, which if you make it in Hollywood and you make it on a show, we all know where you've been. It is so tough to do. She's not exactly the most conventional royal bride. She's divorcee, mixed race. The relationship's been very quick. She's got to have a thick skin. She's been through a lot. She's seen the world. She's experienced other cultures. Some of the newspapers aren't necessarily using her on the front pages because they're saying that they don't, she doesn't necessarily appeal to their audience. A lot of the TV and online media groups say fantastic, great response which does suggest there's some sort of divide age-wise, maybe, in the way that she's been looked. There's no doubt that this royal wedding will be good for the UK economy, that it will be good press around the world for the UK, that it will have a kind of soft diplomatic role, the royal family. They already do and they already are being wheeled out to kind of, in many cases, try and be a kind of softer side of diplomacy in the midst of all the Brexit negotiations. We've seen the royal family doing kind of tours of Europe to kind of show a different face of the UK. We don't have royal families in America, and that's just not something that, um, you know, America has never been that way. And there are many royal families, but this is the biggest of the royals. So I think seeing an American marry into this type of family, it gives us a, oh yeah, you know, we did it. We're part of this, too. How did royal protocol reach this unprecedented level of relaxation? History. There are other royal torchbearers to thank for this new era of royal matrimony. From the solemnity of the Abbey, the great pageant starts toward Buckingham Palace. The young couple now occupying the state coach. Her Royal Highness Queen Elizabeth tackled staunch opposition when she revealed her intention to marry Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark. On the balcony where kings and queens have appeared unnumbered times on great occasions, the young couple happily share the supreme day of their lives with their countrymen. This royal union unwittingly paved the way for the incredibly scrutinized marriage of Prince William to his college roommate, Kate Middleton. Kate, a commoner and with no royal lineage, became a target of royal critics and the paparazzi. William and Kate even took legal action when she was taken, photographs of her were taken topless. But I think that you find that Kate was worried about the involvement of the paparazzi with her children, you know, pushed very hard on William as well. With three out of four of Queen Elizabeth's children divorced, who could deny this young couple? The marriage was supported not only by the royal family, but by more than two billion people worldwide. For a long time, the idea of family became quite toxic for the royal family. I mean, it used to be, if we think back to the Victorian era, the thing that the monarchy was, was a royal family and they became the kind of preeminent family in the country and you know Albert and Victoria and the children they were looked upon as this kind of ideal family and that's what the monarchy traded on being this kind of family monarchy the problem then became particularly in the 80s and 90s when the queen's children's marriages were folding that actually the idea that the royal family was somehow a kind of family that we should all aspire to and somehow that mirrored our lives and that was somehow represent, it, you know, it, it all felt problematic. And so that the whole brand got quite mixed and it got quite toxic. But in recent years, there's been a kind of reaffirmation of, of family. William and Harry have learnt from the past royal wedding. They saw their mum unhappy in her wedding and they didn't want that for themselves. William and Kate are very much a young family with two children, soon to be three children, and of course now Harry and Meghan. So there is a sense that family and relationships are now being brought back. They've realised that they can be happy and it's up to them to make themselves happy and I think actually Queen Elizabeth has recognised that also and that's why she's been so understanding. Kate became the Duchess of Cambridge and the first commoner since 1660 to marry into the British royal family. 
Royals have married commoners before. Charles has married a commoner, a divorcee. Charles married, to all intents and purposes, his first wife, a commoner. Yes, she was aristocracy, but she wasn't royal. William married a commoner. Princess Margaret married a commoner. So it's not new. Number one, there are no German princesses. There are no real, you know, you've got to get lucky if you want them to marry in to the royal family and hope that there's some, another royal family, hope there's some love connection. Two, I think that uh, those days is pretty much gone. Not only did William's choice turn a few royal heads, but so did Kate's now iconic wedding dress. Designed by Sarah Burton of Alexander McQueen, the dress won over critics around the globe. I think she got inspired by Grace Kelly's dress. She had um, a cummerbund made of satin and a nine foot train. It was such a princess dress. Prince Charles's failed marriage to Lady Diana became a media sensation when, in a revealing interview, Diana revealed Charles's affair with Camilla Parker Bowles. Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. <laughs> in the early years of her marriage, no one thought that the young Lady Diana Spencer would later spend years in turmoil due to her failed marriage. In fact, Diana's wedding to Charles was right out of a Disney film, complete with a fairy tale dress to match. Princess Diana's dress to me reflected the 1980s. It was a poofy dress made of taffeta, so very iridescent. She was very dramatic, had the 25 foot train, didn't fit in you know, all of the carriage. It was beautiful and it was a timeless piece also. Alas, Diana's marriage did not last and predictably, Prince Charles eventually married Camilla. It took years for Charles to secure the Queen's approval. Charles and Camilla have that lingering baggage of the relationship as it evolved in its early days and the implications for Diana and so on. As divorcees, their wedding was a far cry from the pomp and ceremony of a traditional royal celebration. But their nuptials were a sign that times have changed. Meghan Markle need not worry thanks to the royal divorcees that have gone before her. The Queen's children's marriages haven't been successful. And so when the Queen found out about Meghan and Harry and he told her that this romance was serious, I was told that she was, she was very happy for him, that really all she wants is, is for her children and of course her grandchildren to be happy. With the issue of divorcee status a non-event, we eagerly turned to speculation on the dress, hats and design. Royal correspondents and betting houses are endlessly speculating on who the chosen designer might be. Her Canadian friend Jessica Mulrooney, who has helped style her in the past, will be somebody to help her style her wedding dress as well because she has been known to work on weddings as well. That is the wife to ex-Prime Minister Brian Mulroney's son, Ben Mulroney, and they'll probably be in attendance at the wedding. I'm assuming that she's helped style her for numerous occasions, so I'm sure she's also leaning on Jess for some help right now. No one knows the pressure of designing the perfect celebrity wedding gown than designers Sally and Danielle Danajou. Having recently joined forces with Italian designer Rosella Espinov on their new collection, they know what it takes for making a bride shine on her special day. I think if it was a celebrity wedding, she could be more of herself. She could, you know, enhance her personality and be able to wear what she wants to wear. But I feel as though because it is a royal wedding and there are rules, she's going to have to also think of the venue, St. George Cathedral, that she's going to show respect to the queen and to the rules. And I think the train of her dress will probably have a petticoat or some type of tool underneath it to add to the dramatic effect because when she steps into the St. George Chapel, everyone's going to have all eyes on her and it's going to have to be a dramatic effect. I think it's going to be really interesting after the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle on exactly how much Markle effect is going to happen and when. The wedding dress is the best thing that you could get to do in your whole career as a designer. It will start a whole new trend of clothing. If it's like history repeating itself, I'm assuming, like Kate, it's going to happen immediately. The moment that Kate walked out in her wedding dress with sleeves, 
sleeves and wedding dresses became very, very popular right after that. Kate's dress was copied so many times in different formats, different materials. Again, stepped into the spotlight on May 19th and revealed her wedding gown to one billion spectators. A global design frenzy occurred. Everybody would, would be want to be dressing Megan from the moment she appears on her wedding day. It's going to be photographed, televised. Her effect is going to be huge, just like any celebrity. The difference is she's a princess, and that is going to make a huge difference. Megan has established herself as a bankable favorite for style trend setting, and the fashion industry is standing at attention. What you're going to have is fashion designers that are making ready wear attire where they can go ahead and produce it quickly and manufacture it quickly, sell it, and then as soon as that inventory sells out, Meghan Markle will go ahead and put her Markle spin on it again. As a Hollywood actress, Meghan had become well known for her style, but as a future royal, her accessible, polished looks are triggering fashion sales on a planetary scale. This is much more than just a wedding, it's a cultural shift. Megan will keep her individual style and casual sheet. Um, it will be elevated because she has access to every single brand in the world, really. What people will tune into are going to be the fashion trends. People will tune into what happens culturally, who's going to be there, and who else is accepting of the wedding in the new royal family. Dress design has played a vital role in the royal weddings, especially when tying two nations together. In the medieval period, the early modern period, royal marriages were a way to create diplomatic alliances. So, you know, it was really, really important. Queen Elizabeth's dress was a symbol of her monarchy of Great Britain and Commonwealth, but was subjected to criticism due to the elaborate design so soon after World War II. It was two years off of World War II and people were still standing in line waiting for rationings. It was a time period that they had to be very careful about not sending a message to people in the UK that they were spending all of this money when people were still really struggling. I think now times are definitely very different, but I still think that Meghan has a little bit of that thought in her. A royal wedding dress should please the people, stand up to the fashion test, and look beautiful from behind. But more importantly, a royal wedding dress becomes a symbolic measure of the union politically, socially, and becomes a critical part of the historical record. No pressure, Megan. Before newspapers and you know television cameras it was about ambassadors coming to a, a royal wedding and then writing back to their foreign courts about the splendor of the wedding and that was seen as a kind of indication of the strength and the power and the wealth of a country this wedding will be actually a really happy time for the nation we've had a lot of doom and gloom with brexit the economic forecast isn't particularly bright While Megan has the difficult task of choosing the right design for her dress, the rest of the wedding guests can have fun working on their fashion. What do you wear to a royal wedding? I mean, that's so hard, is it not? That is so hard. That's probably the hardest task ever in your fashion life. And an essential part of any woman's outfit is a hat. Americans are gonna have the hardest time, I will tell you that. They are going to say, do I wear a hat or do I not wear a hat? I mean, that is going to be the question. The Brits love their hats, and this event will be no exception. Hat design for any formal occasion is taken seriously, and a royal wedding, even more so. From large to small, pool to narrow, flat or highly angled, hats allow a splash of playfulness that there should never be any outdoing the bride. I think you will see a lot of hats, a lot of fascinators. I think that we'll see a lot of pastels, a lot of pearls. I think that Americans, though, are gonna kind of take on the same personality of Megan, a little bit of this is who we are and she's one of us and we're going to represent that. Meghan Markle is not the first actress or American to marry into a royal family. When American actress Grace Kelly married Prince Rainier III of Monaco in 1956, 
Monica was politically and financially turbulent. Grace Kelly's poise and elegance brought a refreshing change and a welcome diversion to the small country. She wasn't born a royal, but she was Hollywood royalty. Grace Kelly dress is so timeless. The wedding gown was a gift from her friend, Helen Rose, and she brought the dress, I, I believe, from America, and then they worked on it, and she had two petticoats underneath that was made of taffeta and had uh, Brussels rose lace that was 125 years old. It has held its time, I think, as one of the most beautiful dresses. If I was to compare Meghan to Royal Bride of the Past, it probably would be in some ways, maybe Grace Kelly, because obviously they were both actresses and film stars, so they married into a very different kind of establishment. But what was great about Grace Kelly was that she was somebody who was empathetic and sympathetic, and the general public fell in love with those people. It's a useful comparison to look at Princess Grace, and when she married into the Monaco royal family, she had to really give up the life that she had always known. You know, she was coming from Hollywood to a very small principality, Monaco, and actually what she did was she put Monaco on the map. Grace may have paved the way for Meghan, but the young bride will carve out her own path in this new life. Well, Meghan's not going to put the UK on the map. You know, we are on the map. The royal family is very famous. But I think in the same way that Princess Grace brought us a bit of magic, I think, to the royal family, that sprinkling of stardust, I think you're gonna see the same with Meghan. Meghan is a free spirit, so I can definitely see her being cautious about the things that she agrees to do, but then also living out truly what she believes in. So I think it's gonna be an interesting mix this time around. Meghan Markle can be described as a bit of a health nut. Her now disabled blog, The Tig, gave several tips on how to have a healthy lifestyle. There was so much more that I wanted to share and I really do have an organic and deep love of travel and of food. Though all brides will lose some weight before their big day, Megan incorporates healthy eating and juicing on a daily basis. Megan's been getting into great shape recently that the combination of the vegan diet five days a week and the juicing veganism and vegetarian options are becoming more and more popular and increasingly easier to gain access to, especially in restaurants and eating out now. Being vegan and following a vegan diet done properly with some structure means that you could benefit from more fiber, more magnesium. Her eating habits and healthy outlook on life has also rubbed off on Harry. Recently, the young prince looked pretty buff as his wedding day approached. If one partner is following a routine like a vegan diet or any dietary changes, it's always more effective if both partners are involved. A diet or a, an effort to achieve a physique change can be hindered by a partner not being on board um, in full. And actually, if Harry's benefiting from anything that Meghan's doing, then that can only be a good thing um, if both of them feel confident going into the wedding going forwards. In addition to her healthy eating habits, Meghan also incorporates yoga as part of her daily routine, mostly thanks to her mom, who is a yoga coach in Los Angeles. Yoga is something that could have a massive benefit to someone pre-wedding. If you think about the stress involved of planning a wedding, the anxious, yoga is renowned for being quite relaxing, a lot of blood flow, good for mental health, and reducing stress. Big breath in, and down again. Relax. If she's doing yoga, then yoga can only have a positive effect on this because from my experience, it's normally flexibility or mobility for someone's range of movement and exercise, or if they can hold certain positions in exercise, that actually has a big impact on how effective exercise routines can be. Yeah, yeah. then relax. This May, Windsor Castle, a residence of English and British monarchs for nearly 1,000 years, will become a hive of activity, teeming with members of the royal household. The task at hand, the wedding of Prince Harry to Meghan Markle, a fairy tale romance that has captured the global media attention. It's gonna be very interesting because the royal wedding won't be in London. First of all, it's going to be in Windsor, which is a beautiful place. But I think what's going to be very interesting is, first of all, how are the massive, massive crowds going to be managed? 
because that whole place is going to be full of so many tourists, so many people from London coming up and wanting to see or get a glimpse of the royal family. All the hotels in Windsor are booked out, postcards, all the replica mugs. Built in the 11th century by William the Conqueror, Windsor Castle is the oldest inhabited royal abode in Europe. It's history so rich and long that it requires a full operation of historians and curators to manage. Windsor Castle was built by orders of William the Conqueror, who came to England in 1066. There was a, a royal palace in what is now called Old Windsor, which was then just Windsor. But William decided to build his castle on this outcrop on the hill, and a much larger. It is actually the largest lived-in castle in the world. From its majestic grounds to its ornate interior and former inhabitants, there's no doubt that its history could give new meaning to the saying, if the walls could talk. Virtually all kings and queens of England lived there at some time. And of course, it is one of our queen's favorite residents. One subject causing a lot of talk is the cost of this royal wedding. Event planning professionals estimate that with security, the celebration could cost upward of $42 million. We're living through very grave times where terrorism is rife. And if you have a big wedding in London, it becomes a security nightmare. If you have a wedding, albeit uh, not as big at Windsor, security is containable. Windsor Castle is containable. The security at the wedding is absolutely over the top almost. Windsor will be locked down for the wedding. As far as a, a drive through, a carriage drive or a walk about through the streets of Windsor, that is containable. It is not a nightmare as it would be in London because you've got a long route, say from Buckingham Palace through to Westminster Abbey. It has to be contained. It means a lot of police on the ground. And who pays for that? At the end of the day, it's a taxpayer. It is a lot of money. The royal family will pick up the tab for most of the traditional elements, and Meghan, widely admired for her fashion style, is rumored to be paying for her gown. But British taxpayers will fit the bill on the most expensive aspect of all, security. The Queen and the uh, Prince of Wales have said that they'll be covering the cost of the wedding and the reception, so that, that will not be met by the taxpayer. But of course, the biggest bill at any royal wedding is always going to be security. It was a huge bill of millions of pounds for William and Kate's wedding. The G20, United Nations Assembly and the Olympics are all working examples of costly and intense 21st century security. A wedding is an occasion that, for many, would not fall into this category of importance and cost. Though let's downplay uh, Meghan and Harry's wedding. It's not going to be uh, Westminster Abbey. It's not going to be St Paul's Cathedral. I personally don't think that means anything in terms of the impact it will have. From a security standpoint, it'll be much easier because Windsor Castle itself is a secure zone. The policing of it, there is a template for that that we'll improve upon and work upon. So in that sense, it's a very good move. You might expect it to be slightly smaller at Windsor because obviously the venue is very different from central London and it's going to be a smaller wedding ceremony, but security is still going to be paramount. Windsor Castle means it's smaller, it's nicer, it's containable. So it's not as big a threat having it at Windsor as it would be having it in the centre of London. Supporters, however, are quick to point out that security is not only for the safety of the royals and their guests, but for the vast numbers of Brits and tourists who will turn out for the celebration. We're from Los Angeles, California. Yes, both of us. Upstate New York. Hi. Come and see uh, the big, big uh, shindig that's going to happen. The wedding, yes. We're happy for her, but we feel like he picked the wrong American. I was free. I'm not now, though, but I was free last year. The whole operation will be incredibly tight and will make use of a computer drone surveillance system, mounted police, and airport-style security screenings. The roads are closed from 8 o'clock in the morning. There's so much police presence. We've never had this before. Just for the, during the wedding itself and then uh, reopen uh, probably about like one, two o'clock. And then we will have 92,000 people descending on the park street. Hopefully the bill will be offset by all the tourism and that, that boom in tourism trade that will, that will come Britain's way as a result of the Royal Wedding. We certainly saw that 
back in um, 2011. Oh, it's been fantastic, man. Worldwide coverage of people. We're expecting between 25 and 30,000 people on the green over here. All over the world, Mexico, Brazil, Norway, Japan, America, Australia. While Harry and Meghan could have married in the high-profile Westminster Abbey, they asked permission from the Queen to have their wedding performed in the St. George's Chapel of Windsor Castle. Their decision caused public curiosity to swell, and it became apparent that, like Her Royal Highness Queen Elizabeth herself, Windsor is important to Harry and Meghan. Windsor Castle essentially is the Queen's home. Buckingham Palace, if you like, is the office. And if she's going to spend anywhere in the, in the evening, that's going to be there. Because behind the walls of the castle, you have the state apartments, she got her private apartments, and that really is the way that she lives. Queen Elizabeth's mother, father, and sister's funerals were all held at St. George's Chapel. Harry's father's second marriage service was performed just down the road at Windsor Guildhall. But the prayer and dedication service for Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall were conducted at St. George's. It's seen as the seat of the royal family. It's been there since the days of William the Conqueror. And also when it came to the royal family changing their name from Sax Cobert Gotha because it was too Germanic during the First World War. When they were looking for a name, they had others thrown in there like Plantagenet, which had been there before, Stuart, and they chose Windsor because to them, Windsor suggested very much solid foundations of the royal family, the solid foundations of the castle. These family ties are a part of what binds Harry to Windsor Castle, but for the once wild prince, relationship to place might run deeper. There are real memories here for Harry of growing up, learning to ride horses, and it was just a short walk from school for visits with his grandmother. Harry was based at Windsor with his regiment. He's also went to school around the corner at Eton College. And apparently, Meghan and, and Harry spent a lot of time romancing each other in a frog ball. What used to be the Duke of Windsor, Edward VIII's estate, and apparently spent a lot of time there. I think it's really great that they've decided to do it like this. I think it changes the tradition. And again, it shows that they aren't the normal royal couple, they want to change things around and they wanted to have it at Windsor where they feel it's more intimate. A place for both happy and solemn occasions, Windsor Castle has also seen its fair share of tragedy. In 1992, a fire burned and destroyed a significant portion of the upper ward section, including the private chapel and approximately 100 staterooms. A shock and horror in the fact that it took hold so quickly. Um, I mean, I happened to be around the castle when it, when it started, um, and I heard the fire alarm, and some two or three minutes later, um, when I came out of the room that I was actually in, you could see the smoke, uh, not as extensive as, as uh, it is now, but you could definitely see it. What was your mother's reaction? Her mother? Her Majesty was shocked. The Queen was devastated, but she was also very much hands-on. She was there, she was taking out valuables. There were her sons there, there was her husband there. They were all helping. The fire burned for 15 hours and needed several hundred staff and firefighters to contain it. It devastated the Queen, who grew up with Windsor Castle as a significant part of her life and her family's history, but a portion of which is now gone forever. It spread very, very rapidly and destroyed a very significant part of the castle. The Windsor Castle fire caused much controversy due to the extensive and costly restorations that it would need. Politicians and the British public wanted to know who will pay. The issues over money and restoration triggered the Queen's decision to allow tourism to pay for the cost of renovations. And now the public can experience Windsor Castle in person. If you go into the castle today, it's absolutely beautifully restored exactly to what it was before the fire. We are sure that with a national treasure like Windsor, its people are only too happy to do their bit in return for experiencing a priceless piece of history. But it is not only Windsor Castle that is full of rich history, Berkshire County, in which it sits, is one of the most beautiful counties in England 
and one of the original historic counties formed and governed by the Normans in the Middle Ages. It was also recognized as a royal county by the Queen in 1957 due to Westminster Castle sitting within its modern-day border. The Queen's very comfortable there as well because remember the Queen will be 92 by the time, or just about 92 by the time they get married. And that's pretty old. And obviously Prince Philip will be nearly 98, I think. So, you know, they've got to think about the rest of the family, not just themselves. There's no doubt that Berkshire is an excellent choice. And as we've discovered, it has unique connections to the younger members of the royal family, from school to sport to dating and family. Kate Middleton is from Berkshire, and her mother and father still live nearby. In fact, Will and Kate have been spotted by patrons of Pot Kiln Pub, a country favorite featuring fresh game meats and local beverages. Pot Kiln is a quintessentially English pub. It has got beers that were brewed here. It's got food that is actually reared here in the woods. We sit in the midst of 9,000 acres of farmland and woodland, and that's quite unique. Our back larder is basically all the wild food and game you can eat and very, very much at the heart of our menu and our philosophy and our culture is compassionate farming and husbandry. We are very focused on wild food and quintessential British dishes. The Middletons have been coming here for years because they've had their own home just up the road from here. And they come because it's a place where they can feel private, where they can feel uh, they can entertain themselves and be looked after, but still be around their familiar friends and family. The royal family have come from William to Kate to Harry. They've all been here at some point in time. When any of the royal family do come, they just come and blend. They just sit in. And while others may look and watch and think, they just, just the other day they were here, moved the tables aside, started to play darts. Probably significantly, there's a very big difference that's relevant to the royal family is history over nostalgia. Many people think of history, that doesn't drive an emotion, but actually nostalgia, that which we've experienced with grandparents or royal families and friends, they pack an, unpack an envelope of emotions. It's been quite a buzz about the forthcoming marriage of Meghan and Harry because of course part of the family lives around here, so I think it lifts people's spirits. At one time I was not someone who wanted to think or talk much about the royal family, but I've learned something from being here and getting to know Carol and Michael, that actually they do bring a lot of uh, spirit and enthusiasm to people's lives. So yes, they're a lovely balanced family. They're a very, very family focused family where they are very joined and bonded. Redefining royalty in Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's world will continue immediately after their wedding vows are complete with a tradition breaking stand-up reception. From what I've heard, there's probably going to be about 600 guests at the actual wedding service, but I know that it is going to be a private royal um, reception. So I think that it will be a small 200 guests maybe list of the actual reception, and I think it will follow tradition. And I think Megan is going to honor that and want that for the family. I think she will really show her personality on her reception. It's going to be elegant. I think it's going to have all the royal traditions of the past of their family. It's gonna be completely unexpected. I wonder if there will be a ton of embellishment. Meghan and her prince, fast becoming known as the Royal Rebels, have been involved in every step of the menu design, have attended tastings. The couple were involved in tasting everything. They've been into, involved in every detail. They have also requested that each dish is created from as many local and seasonal ingredients as possible. Royal chef Mark Flanagan and his team couldn't be happier with this request because the timing coincides perfectly with seasonal British produce at its succulent best. The couple wanted us to, to make sure that we used all the local seasonal produce as much as possible throughout their menu. This recent good weather is really helping us to achieve that. In fact, much of the fresh food will be harvested from the Queen's estates. It doesn't get more local than that. You don't get many opportunities in your lifetime to do a royal wedding, so this is very, very special. 
you know, the care, the attention and the detail to everything. It really is very exciting. Guests will enjoy two bite morsels and bowl food easily devoured while mingling. More importantly, Harry and Megan will be able to do the same. Here I'm preparing the milk chocolate truffles with um, a lovely uh, milk and kirsch center. Um, this is a typical item that we prepare for our receptions and private parties. Then, just when guests might be thinking they could need another bite, the rebelliousness continues with the cutting of a wedding cake that blows tradition right out of the water. Being a foodie, I think Megan is going to have a little bit of influence. I don't know that the cake is gluten-free or anything like that. Claire Patak, a Californian raised pastry chef, has been asked to make the lemon elderflower cake which will be smothered in buttercream, then decorated with fresh edible flowers. What I know is that Megan has chosen a cake that is a little more American than a typical royal wedding cake in the past. This one is going to be a lemon buttercream from what I hear. So I absolutely think they're gonna cut into this cake and everyone is gonna have a piece. So that's gonna be fun. Chef Tony Sansalone, renowned celebrity cake specialist at the iconic Driscoll Hotel in Austin, Texas, understands the importance of getting a wedding cake right. I love the floral idea with the elderflower. I love the flavor combinations. It's much more seasonally inspired, being spring, a spring wedding. Like the Southern USA, Texas is a long way from Windsor, but traditions remain universal in communities steeped in age-old customs. My interpretation of what a traditional wedding cake would be, an English wedding cake, would be a, a heavy fruit cake, very dense, um, layers of maybe a fruit preserve in there, covered in fondant or marzipan, classically. Whether Harry and Meghan's seasonally inspired cake will trigger a new royal tradition remains to be seen. One thing we can place a safe bet on is that thanks to social media, a brand new wedding cake trend will hit the wedding industry and most likely on a global scale. The way things are nowadays with social media, a lot of our cakes are driven off of social media. So. You know, I, I'm sure little girls think about what their wedding cake's going to look like when they, that big day, their magic day comes. And... There's no doubt that Megan has her fingerprints on this cake design, but her Californian roots mesh perfectly with the best of spring in the United Kingdom. As dawn broke over the majestic grounds of Windsor Castle on Saturday, May 19, 2018, this morning was not like any other. The tiny town of Windsor was now adorned with flags and bunting bursting with British pride. Cobblestone streets and the castle's long walk were filled with those who had come from lands far, far away. Guests that had come to witness a fairy tale that had now become a reality. We came from uh, San Francisco. Alexandria, Virginia. This is my third day. As celebrity guests, including the Cloonies and the Beckhams, and the royal family made their way into the chapel, the world held its breath for the first glimpse of the young bride. Before long, the American girl who fought her way to the top of Hollywood made her way down the long walk of the historic castle to the cheers of thousands. The much anticipated moment had now arrived. In a breathtakingly regal dress by Givenchy and British designer Claire Wade Keller, Meghan made her way into the chapel to meet her prince at the altar. Harry and Meghan, I now invite you to join hands and make your vows in the presence of God and his people. The ceremony was filled with love and tenderness. I, Harry, take you, Megan. I, Harry, take you, Megan. To be my wife. To be my wife. I, Megan, take you, Harry. I, Megan, take you, Harry. To be my husband. To be my husband. A prince moved to tears and a congregation filled with joy. And afterwards, it was all sealed with a kiss.
As the sun set on Windsor Castle, one thing was certain, that fairy tales do exist and love can conquer all. This wedding celebration broke away from a great deal of royal tradition, complete with late night food trucks serving comfort food to its guests. It is a sign of the times, but it speaks volumes of the United Kingdom's newly wedded royals. I'm excited to see all of the things that she's gonna accomplish as being a duchess. I think that she brings a new vibe and she is a vital team player in the royal family. Harry and Meghan will break with protocol when they please, but in a way that remains the poise and grace of the constitutional monarchy. I think she might find it a little boring being a member of the royal family. If you've been used to the glitz of lights, clamor, action, and being a star, and uh, you know, even on a show, Netflix show like Suits, she's always had an, an inkling for that sort of stardom. Now, if she feels that's going to be the same as being a member of the royal family, it really is. The British people have gained in Meghan, a hardworking, down-to-earth new royal. We do not doubt that she will make a difference to many people's lives in her new role. I'll be disappointed if I see Meghan go too far conservative, but I think it's inevitable. I think that she'll still be able to, when she's you know in the country with Harry or traveling, which they'll probably do loads of, she could probably still be herself and her own you know normal boho style. She'll probably have to get rid of the ripped jeans for good. The monarchy has already been swept up into a 21st century transformation after the marriage of Prince William and Kate, who have managed to do things a little differently. But Will and Kate lie in a direct path to the throne, and so do their children. We will have King Charles um, and possibly Queen Camilla before we have um, King William and Queen Catherine. That's how the royal family works. It's constitutional monarchy and that's what will happen. But some might argue that it'll be the younger royals who perhaps have a bigger role in terms of moving the monarchy forward into the 21st century, really keeping in touch with young people, with the next generation. Prince Charles III has often made comments that startle many of the protocol watchdogs, one of them, a desire to turn Buckingham Palace into a hotel on occasion. But like Prince William and the Duchess Kate, Charles is in the first in line to the throne and may not be up to taking the same risks that a younger royal might. People think that he's gonna be king like he's been Prince of Wales, you know, have an opinion on things, meddle in politics, be passionate about causes, be a sort of relative open book. These, the sense now is that when he now knows that when he becomes king, he can't be that. It goes against the role of a constitutional monarch and he's gonna have to sort of shut up really and toe the line. And I think there's a sense of, or growing sense of acceptance that he knows that. But there is no doubt that he's gonna have a tough act to follow and you know, who knows how that's going to play out. I think it's very unpredictable. It was Prince William who once said that modernisation is a hard word to use with the monarchy, and it is because it, it's everything we don't expect of being modern. It's age-old, it's historical, it's traditional, but actually in, in order for the monarchy to exist and to continue to be successful, it does have to modernise, and the Queen recognises that. It's why we've seen her take to Twitter, announce things on Facebook, and get involved with a, a spoof with her son to promote the Invictus Games with the Obamas. You know, that's all a way of connecting to a modern society. And I think what she realised is that the real connection for the future is, of course, the next generation of royals. Harry and Meghan's children will be brought up under the scrutiny that comes with being born a royal. But there can be no doubt that Meghan will bring new energy into the family and maintain some of her Californian zen with any future royal babies. Oh my God, imagine 
I would love if they were coming out wearing like Guns N' Roses t-shirts and being super American. I wonder, I sometimes think, will she become more conservative? Obviously if she has a child, she's married to the royal family. But the other thing is that we have to remember that Prince Harry's married her for, for her. She's married him for him. It's not about protocol, it's not about the family, it's about the two people who are in love. And I think she's one of those people who's strong enough to have a consistent style, to be of strong of mind to look the way she wants to look and I think that's what is such a big breath of fresh air to everybody that she'll bring her own Meghan Markle look to the British shores. I think that her style is going to remain and you will see her wearing great coats, um, great little cute handbags. Internet trolls can speculate all they like on Harry and Meghan's future children's skin. The rest of the world will embrace and cherish the differences in such a royal lineage. After all, it reflects a present day United Kingdom and delivers exciting possibilities for future royals who fall in love with so-called commoners. It'll be so exciting to see these kids that are, you know, half American, half English and growing up in the royal family. You take the Harry, Meghan, Markle relationship back 20 years, that, that wouldn't have gone down so well 20 years ago. You know, the royal family and, and its attitude to life was changing because it had to change, because it was out of date. But it's very much up to date now, and it's going to improve even more so now with the likes of, of William and Harry. This is about happiness rather than protocol, and I think that's a fantastic step. I think that they're in it for the long haul. Um, having no prenup speaks volumes for them. I think that they know that this truly is, I love this person, I'm in this relationship for the long haul, whether they're a, in the royal family or not. That's not a relationship that you easily break apart. I think we're gonna see this forever. As the sun sets on this historical wedding, the future looks bright for a new generation of royals, determined to create a legacy that will make an enormous impact on their own United Kingdom and the world.